And the client said, so I'm buying this building and you're telling me to effectively destroy and throw away a big chunk of it <laughs> in order to create an atrium and allow light into the building. And we said, if you don't do this, this building won't be suitable for the purpose you intended. Welcome to the Architecture, Design, and Photography podcast, where we dig a little deeper into what motivates the creatives in these fields. Today, we are speaking with architect Patrick Coston, a principal at Canal 5 Studio in Portland, Maine. He has over 30 years of professional experience in award-winning building design, and he is a licensed architect in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts, and Illinois and a lead accredited accredited professional through the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, Our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design, so don't miss out on Patrick's AIA Design Theory article in the upcoming February issue of Maine Home and Design. Patrick Costin, thank you for coming into the studio today. Thank you for inviting me. (laughs) So how are you doing? Good. Good? Good. It's nice to be here. Ah, not working. It's a Friday. It's sunny not, outside. Nothing else to do as a principal of a firm on a Friday, right? No, no. Friday's a good day of the good week. Day. <laughs> so first question, I generally like to jump right into the the most perplexing questions, but uh, from what bedrock foundation of truth do you judge and create good architecture? You are jumping into the deep end of the pool with that question. Yeah, when you look at a piece of architecture, by what measure do you say, oh, that's no good, or wow, that's good? I, I do that by how it makes me feel. And uh, there's, I often use the metaphor of a tuning fork that really great architecture, meaningful architecture, beautiful architecture, creates an emotional resonance in me that makes me excited and uh, uh, excited. Uh, I I just feel uh, the power of place and space and in a way that doesn't happen in most of the built environment. Right. To me, I, I get what you're saying. And to me, I'm not a big person on traditional or, you know, even older architecture, but, um, that's a pretty broad and bad statement. But anyways, the, the Pantheon to me, when I walked into that Mm. space was just, holy cow, you know, it's, it's just incredible. And I get what you're saying that, uh, there's just certain built environments that when you experience them are, uh, just, you know, incredible. They're, they're an experience that just kind of knocks you over, which now, um, now you had in, in our process of photographing some of your architecture, uh, you had mentioned that you occasionally drag your family around and, uh, kind of lecture them on, uh, <laughs> the built environment and architecture. And you also mentioned that, uh, you, you have a photo collection. Tell me about that. Yep. So I most often eat lunch at my desk, uh, for better, or for worse, and, as uh, part of that activity over the years, I started doing searches on different topics for imagery uh, and collecting images. And it's probably been going on for five or six years now. And I'm uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of over 7,000 images. And the given the number of images that I've collected, I've had to I think, develop a more and more refined sense of what makes an image powerful to me or makes me say, click, I want to save this for later and go back to it. And increasingly, I, I search for images that pull me into them and are and create, ironically, the same response I have physically when I'm uh, in, out in the world and about and, and uh, experience either a great public space or a, a powerful building or even just a room. Uh, it can operate at all those different scales uh, and listen to what happens in my chest 
uh, when I see something as the the measure of, yeah, this is a keeper versus mm. an image that might have uh, uh, interesting content or compelling content that makes uh, for an interesting subject matter or uh, moment, uh, but it doesn't have the emotional hit to my chest that other images do. And that emotional hit is coming from the photographic built environment. Right. It, sometimes it's pictures of people. Sometimes it's pictures mm. of places. Sometimes it's pictures of objects. Uh, but they're, uh, and, and the, the thing that I've been trying to reflect on more and more to, to out in my own consciousness. So what, what is it among all these diverse images that I've collected uh, that makes them so compelling to me? And I think some of it is probably connected to memory and uh, experiences I've had in my life. Uh, but I also think that there are uh, images that when composed, whether by happenstance or by intent, can uh, amplify their emotional impact on the viewer. And that's something I'm trying to learn about so that I can hopefully use that understanding to design more meaningful and hopefully beautiful spaces that, that give people pleasure and enjoyment, uh, which as opposed to simply being a functional utilitarian space. Sure. Yeah, to me, uh, there's what I do professionally 90% of the time is photograph architecture. Um, and I'm always looking, when I'm composing an image, if I can, I'm trying to find a place where the viewer naturally places themselves in the image and how everything else relates to placing that person in that spot in the image and uh, adds to the emotional feel of being in that space. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. where, like when I walk into a room, I'm looking at where, where do I want to look at this room from, where do I want to place the camera, to then communicate that that's the best spot in the room to be to, uh, so it's, a, it's like a two point, you're kind of, envisioning you want to be there but you have to capture the idea of being there from here right you know and you, right. you have those two different things and and that's an interesting for me talking about what i do that's an interesting uh way to work in capturing visuals for a very specific medium architecture the design and built environment compared to images that are also extremely powerful like they're recently they're in the last five years there was an image I think it was from Damascus where this father had his daughter playing in, in a bathtub and it was in a bombed out, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you could tell the it was like rebar and everything hanging and the, the wall of this building was just gone and you were looking out at the devastation of the city. But there was this father here who had filled up the bathtub and his little girl was just playing in it, you mm -hmm. know, and there's just there's an incredible human moment there of amongst all this we still find joy you know and that's just incredibly powerful but it's such a different visual communication and medium and in uh, moment going on mm -hmm. there and and that's a you know they all they all connect and they're all related to some deeper truth um but it's interesting like when when asked about what is a deeper truth that you uh judge the built environment by it still comes down to the subjective feeling of it you know right. and that's uh one thing i learned from architecture school is that there's really no right or wrong there's just a lot of strong opinions right and but but i think all of us would agree that there are moments when meaning resonates in a wide range of people around a a particular building sure. or place right and uh, an experience I had fairly recently was I was in Connecticut and I visited a building uh, called the Grace Foundation uh, it's a, a building designed by Sana 
and uh, it's difficult to describe even to other architects when I got back in town and my colleagues at the firm what it made me feel like but I know that I spent two hours walking around in silence with a whole lot of other people who from what I could see were doing the same thing uh, the building was a destination for those who had no interest in its religious function, which it was a church and a community center for uh, a church. But the power of the building and its relationship to a beautiful setting that it was designed to harmonize with was magnetic and resonant with people who were just coming to be there because of how right. it made them feel. And for me, and we all can describe moments in our lives and places that we go to uh, that create that kind of experience. Uh, the, the thing I would hope eventually to understand or at least better understand is how can the design process achieve to the highest extent possible the, that kind of outcome even if it's very modest in its uh, in the exercise of designing uh, whatever that space or building or place mm. is and I I don't have it I don't have a formula I don't have a I haven't figured it out yet but I I think I've attuned my compass to be much more aware and sensitive to going in this direction pulls me and feels feels like a more uh, uh, meaningful direction to go in than if I turn the other way. And it's almost like what you were just describing in taking a photograph, finding it's so interesting that you go into places and you find a spot where you're in relation to the space that you're in and it's almost like you have a dowser and you're going around the right. room and <laughs> this is where I drill for water. And, right. and there, there are, um, so, so it, so you're looking for the same thing. You're, yeah, you're yeah. finding that place where in relation to what you see, it's, uh, the most meaningful experience yeah. for you. Yeah. That's a, that is a interesting thing that it's not until I really say it that I realize I'm looking for, I'm looking, I don't know if you'd refer to it as I'm looking for the second person perspective on this. I don't, that's probably saying it wrong, but I'm looking for the, where the first person wants to be. It's like when we were shooting the home recently that you had designed that kitchen, you know, yeah. that's where the, that's a really nice place for a person to be. But where's the best place to see that person in that space? You know, you're looking like, okay, that's the best. But then the second, where do we, right. that's an interesting way of approaching it. But like you were saying, um, it, it seems like the lowest hanging fruit to create that emotional connection to me is scale. Like mm. scales just because, uh, my wife and I went to Rome, uh, for our 15th wedding anniversary. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the scale of the baths to the, I believe they were to the North West northeast of the sea i'm, I'm mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they were gigantic just huge mm -hmm. huge huge arches and then the the scale of the ancient ruin ruins there in, in the, the more ancient part of rome the scale that they built just you know putting brick on top of brick you know was just mind-blowing but it's uh awe-inspiring it it creates um what what becomes kind of a, a um an impulse an impulse to worship to a degree. Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. get why churches are built like they are because they take so much work and they create so much wonder. But I wonder what, okay, if the easiest thing, if you can just build huge, what's the next thing that's a little more difficult but still gives you that sense of, of wonder, you know? Yep. Yep. I, th I think you start to get more into the, you know, shape of the space, not just the size and what that does. And we were kind of talking about that with vanishing points uh in photography 
you know, I, I realize that I'm, I'm constantly putting the camera kind of in the middle of the floor uh, plane and the ceiling plane because then mm-hmm. you get more um, symmetry and mm-hmm. it makes for a mm-hmm. more powerful image. But I also wonder if it's that when you were at that level, you trusted everything more when you were a kid, a little shorter, you know, mm. and maybe that's an emotional connection. That's all, it's all such an interesting conversation that I wish we had more time to talk about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, what, tell me about the most recent photograph you have that's just in your head that you just most recently saved and why I'd be interested to hear that. Good question. I've been very busy lately, so I haven't been uh, not as many uh, lunches not, at the not desk. been having time at lunch to search for photographs. Um, I well, I actually I had an experience just the other day where I was uh, driving to a meeting with a client, and I had uh, I was in my car, and and I remember. I stopped in traffic and looking to my left and there was a view up a street and there was uh, a a scene that captured me uh, at that moment that made me think I should take a picture of that because that that view that 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 moment the light the even the way uh, it was trash pickup day and the way trash cans had been arrayed all the way up and it went up a hill to a vanishing point um, that uh, that just I realized that's that's a photo I would save I that moment Hmm. I would capture and that happens hundreds if not thousands of times during given day where you're moving through the world and then suddenly you either turn a corner you see a face you look down a street you see a building uh, you see the way light moves through uh, 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 trees as the wind blows all of those it's really sort of a it's experience in the way most human beings do experience the world, which is visually, and being able to recognize when inside yourself, because it, I don't know how much of it is out in the world. It's, it's this unique chemistry that happens when, when you walk into a building, for example, and you very quickly size up how it makes you feel even if it's unconscious and uh and you you experience it when it talks to you visually in the moment that you turn a corner or you enter a room or you see a material or a detail uh it's um it's very difficult to articulate and architects i think often try hard to articulate as a way of sharing it with other professionals these experiences and these understandings and so that they can sharpen their ability to design more effectively and more powerfully and successfully and they forget that non-professionals who don't have that language have those experiences too. So, right. so the, for me, one of the really great moments uh, in my career is when I get a client who hires me to, uh, because we share this kind of resonant relationship. You get it. There, we yeah. get each other and the client wants help from me to make happen in the physical world uh, the experience that we both understand and value uh, occur in Mm -hmm. whatever setting it happens to be and that's that's very rare because uh, most commissions architecturally are much more driven by budget 
and functional requirements or the market. It's right. it's not a search for beauty and beauty experience and meaning as much. and value and legacy. Uh, so um, so I I think. Uh, and I've only had a few experiences in my career where I've had clients like that, but they've been among the most powerful experiences I've had practicing architecture. In, uh, in studying the visual world and the way that you do and trying to capture it uh, just in your own memories and capture uh, it in photos that you collect, that you've seen, um, do you think because you study it so much, is there an, is there an ability to lose the wonder of it because you're studying it? Not for me. I think there's, it's magical, uh, to me how you can capture or you can see an image or experience a place through your eyes and have it so powerfully affect you. I, I, uh, that's really cool. See, yeah, I'm, I, uh, I listened to this, uh, interview with, um, it wasn't Cuba Gooding Jr. It was another guy that looks very similar to him. I forget his name, but, um, he, this actor was, uh, speaking on how he studies, uh, interactions of people. And the negative thing it has on his life is that it detaches him from the actual experience. Mm-hmm. Like he'll be interacting with someone or watching someone else interact with someone, you know, in close proximity. And instead of allowing himself to be in the moment and experience the shared emotions in relationship, he's outside of it studying it mm-hmm. so he can uh, internalize it and regurgitate it as an actor later. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, as you were describing what you were talking about, you you don't seem, that's why I asked the question. You don't seem to be losing wonder with it because it's, um, I think something that is interesting is that there's no, you're never going to find the black and white answer to beauty. It just Mm -hmm. is. Um, but I've found in my own personal life studying, uh, deeper, into uh, spiritual belief in focusing on the religious acts, aspects of it has made me lose wonder with a lot of that. And in, in, so you can, I, and now I call it the study lose wonder effect. Mm. <laughs> and Becoming an adult. <laughs> yeah, it's a process of maturing in some ways that I don't appreciate, but I can't avoid either. And, mm. and uh it doesn't mean, you know, I lose faith completely or I don't appreciate the built environment or, you know, as I studied architecture and architecture school, I came to appreciate certain buildings less mm-hmm. or at least find like, oh, wow, they really messed that one up. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you started to see things more through uh, a, a more well-informed lens to a degree. Yeah. And so, you know, when someone would come with the uh, floor plans that they did on uh, Google SketchUp, you know, I had my dad taught in uh, the religion department or the, yeah, religion department in the university where I was at. And one of his uh, faculty, one of his fellow professors brought plans that he had made on Google. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was like, look at this. These are great. Who needs people like you? Like, just kind of joking, like, you know, as I was studying architecture, you know, and I looked at him and I didn't respond. It was just like, oh, and then like five minutes later, I'm like, well, you know, anyone can go read a Bible. Why would anyone need you? You know, he didn't get it that there's a deeper understanding in any uh, discipline. It's kind of interesting. But um, so next question, design is highly influenced by social and technical changes in our culture. Things like kitchen design and residences. You know, 150 years ago, the kitchen was a separate building. Mm-hmm. Technical advances then made it uh, able to have the kitchen within the house, but then it was usually separated out into a, a completely walled off space because you didn't want to see the mess and all that. And maybe the help or whatever, or the, the woman of the house back then would be the person doing that and then coming out and presenting a meal. Mm. Where now we live in a culture where it's like my house is 
kitchen, dining, living all in one big room. Yeah. And we love it because you're not making food and being separated from everyone and it's, you know, all together. Um, how are the technical uh, changes in our current society that are ramp ramping up so quickly? How are they uh, affecting architecture and design in your opinion? I think the way human beings relate to one another and the the frame of human consciousness is changing because of technology. And that, an example I would offer is one of my uh, kids is in France right now for a year. Another is away at college, but our ability to stay in touch, to see each other, to FaceTime one another uh, is now a commonplace reality that 10 years ago didn't exist and the distance and time and context uh, can be leapfrogged by technology. I have a sister that works out of her house with colleagues who are in m multiple continents for multinational companies that span the globe, but she works out of her house and all she needs is a computer and a phone. That's, that's just not something that existed 10 years ago, as commonly as it does today, and it's accelerating. So to your question, I, I think the pace of change in the way human beings define their community, define their place in community, are in relation to both one another and to their, even amongst their own family members, is radically shifting and changing in ways that are raising the question, what's the purpose of space and place if the way we relate to one another increasingly is through digital devices that obliterate time and distance. Mm. And this came up in a conference I was at recently about the workplace where uh, the I happened to sit next to a librarian who was there to try to understand with all these technological changes, what is the purpose of a library? Mm. If it's not to store books, right. if your reference librarian is now Google, if what, what, is, a, what is a library? And, and is it a physical place or is it a device in your hand that you allows you to access everything libraries used to offer you? Uh, right. Is it a gathering place? Is it a community space? What is it? it she was uh, she was unclear uh, right. what what was happening to a profession that she had been in for over thirty years that used to be much clearer. So the changes uh, in how Americans live at home and in the workplace uh, are are making, in my view the nature of physical space and how we use it uh, enter into a period of, of rap of e evaluation and, and change. Uh, businesses are uh, finding they can be more productive and use less space than they used to because they don't need human beings to be all together in one place to do work. And so the nature of the workplace in that sense is changing. At the same time, the boundaries between your personal life and your work life are being obliterated mm. because you carry it around in your pocket right, and it right. never stops. So, so I'm, uh, I'm watching and trying to understand as an architect what uh, what the trajectory is of how space supports 
humans and what they need to do uh, when it's when what it is to be a human being and how you relate to other human beings is so rapidly evolving because of of technology right yeah i when i first started as a photographer i kept a uh, a home office and i would find that just after dinner i would i'd go work more you know Mm -hmm. and towards the end of university is when uh you know like pdas started to come in and then smartphones eventually and all that and it made you so much more um uh productive but it everyone still expects you work eight hours a day. It's not like people became more productive and then only worked four hours a day. You'd, you'd, you'd be a lazy slouch if you did that, you know? Mm. And we just pack more in. And I, I think there's, a, there's, there's definitely, and I can feel this in myself, and I don't know if everyone gets this just as they age, but, you know, just a, a pressure of productivity that is constantly sitting on you you know, especially as a business owner, you just constantly have that pressure of, you know, you, you have to think to yourself, it's time for me to relax. I need to not think about those things. And, you know, to have the technology and all that to be able to do it at anywhere, anytime is, you know, a a thing that takes a lot of self-discipline to, to get away from. But yeah, how does that affect the built environment? It seems like, uh, if I were going to have a home office again, I'd need to make it uh, difficult to get to. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, Might be a shed in the backyard. <laughs> fi- yeah, there's got to be, like, I got to walk through the snow or something or, yeah. But. Well, and, and to your earlier question about how it's changing the way, what a home is, um, the the we're all becoming more accustomed to a more ad hoc, improvised, multitasking, Mm. unstructured, but very demanding lifestyle. And by putting all of the living space in one big room and sharing it, the opportunity to be together as a family and to be a community while at the same time accommodating all the different things that simultaneously have to go on is uh, is uh, probably a reflection of the a response to the way our lives are changing. Uh, that's interesting. That we're far less compartmentalized. You know, I, I took the kids out for dinner, but I was on my phone working the whole time. You know, yeah. It's like you think you're doing it, but you're not. And and just yesterday morning, I was trying to get. Uh, some writing done that I was working on. And usually I'll try and sit and meditate uh, and um, think by myself in the dark in the morning until the kids get up. It's like the only time I can have alone that's quiet. And it's usually my youngest son that wakes up first, 99% of the time. My old eldest oldest son woke up first and he bolted downstairs Uh, because he was like, Grayson always gets to have time with dad alone. I'm going to get there. And this is Simon. And he came downstairs, but I was working on this writing. And so he came down and, you know, I greeted him, hugged him, but then I, you know, set up some boundaries. Like I got to work and I got to finish this. He can't talk to me again. You know, I got to, and, you know, I could see his demeanor just really like, oh, and I didn't know that he had woken up and thought like, I'm going to get to dad first. You know, Yeah. I created this inavailability to dad first thing in the morning when I, you know, I could have put that aside and, and just done it later, but I was trying to get stuff done. And I don't think we really realize how much we often are doing that where, you know, we're at dinner, but it's like, there's this phone here and I can't, you know, and you're doing that to your kids and you're doing that to your friends and to your spouse, to your spouse. Yeah. yeah. I mean, bedtime is just, you're on your phone, you know? Like, mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, there's a lot to deal with. And I think our, our society will, have a negative effect and we'll sense it and we'll do some self-correcting, I'm sure. So what, One of the great things that Apple has done in the most recent update is oh, provide the report, screen the time, weekly yeah. report of how much time you're spending on your phone. And it's powerful data that yeah. uh, I think is 
surprising many people. Embarrassing. And <laughs> right. And, oh, I got a, like three and a half hours the other day. I was like, oh, yeah. oh geez, yeah, that's like, a lot of time. It makes you wonder. So where? What could if, I have been getting done? <laughs> well, right. Or or if I'm on my phone that much. W- how am I getting all this other stuff done? You right. know, I mean, like, I think you're getting stuff done on the, I mean, I answer tons of email on my phone and, and all that too. So, you yeah. know, that's that, but yeah. yeah. Anyways. Um, it's rumored that you have spoken on healing through design. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, the, one of the expertise we have in our firm is outpatient medical facilities. And, as opposed to in, inpatient to outpatient. As oppo- to- uh, outpatient is doctor's offices okay. and clinics rather than the hospital. Okay. And, outpatient being hospital. Uh, no. Inpatient is hospital. Outpatient uh, is okay. when you drive to see your pediatrician or your family doctor or something like that. Got it. And, um, and the, but broadly speaking, uh, healing through design is a recognition that the effect space that space and the design of space affects well-being and so while the healthcare industry has started to try to focus on this as another way of increasing well-being and and providing better care to the people that it serves the principles apply uh, across the board, they apply to workspaces in general. People who uh, work in in buildings where there isn't access to natural light, where they feel uh, like they have no control over their uh, environment um, and the conditions that they're working in, uh, spaces that are just not uh, supporting and conducive to human well-being affect productivity affect well-being affect quality of life and so so the the notion of there being a checkbox in the design process that goes beyond is the room big enough does it have right the light switches and the outlets and the furniture and the finishes and all of these other things but is this a is this room a room i like being in is this right. is what this are the building? emotions the person will have through experiencing this room exactly right where is the resonance of place and and the comment there was a project that i did quite a number of years ago now which involved renovating an existing building, but it was not suitable as an office building in its current arrangement because it had been designed actually to be a a large Sears originally in the 1940s. And so a big hole was proposed to be cut in the building to create a four-story atrium. And the transformation was uh, beyond dramatic. It was... uh, stupendous uh, the impact it had and the client when we first proposed this said so I'm buying this building and you're telling me to effectively destroy and throw away a big chunk of it <laughs> in order to create uh, a, uh, an atrium space and, right. and allow light into the building and, and we said if you don't do this this building won't be suitable for the purpose you intend it to, right. to serve. And so we did the project and the client, perhaps a year after they had occupied the building, I ran into him and he said, you know, all I know is every time I walk in the door of this building, I feel good. And yeah. that to me is, uh, we did our job. Right. Uh, and whether that's in someone's house or apartment or workplace or community space, it, that should be the objective of good design. Hmm. Uh, kind of on that note, how do you approach design? Your how do you approach the design process with a client? It starts with listening. 
identifying all the sort of quantitative data that will provide the frame for what we are supposed to do. So by kind that, the I mean... objective data points that right. have to be ticked. Exactly right, which include the budget, the schedule, and the scope or the program of the project. But then there's a whole nother process, which is difficult to describe because it's not a button you can push or a single question you can ask with a client to discover what are you trying to accomplish as a culture or a community or a company or a family through the construction of this building. For some, it's going to be very basic and uh, and the notion of it uh, elevating the human spirit will never make it to the <laughs> the meeting notes right um, but our our goal is to elevate the human spirit not in spite of the client but as a gift to the client for the services as an accompaniment to the services that we provide right and sometimes that involves, careful discernment and observation and just interaction with cult with the culture of the client uh, and whether family organization etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, and it it takes time to do that mm. and it takes a lot of engagement so what one process piece that we do utilize is structuring into the the concept design phase, the earliest phases of the project, time to have those kind of unstructured conversations about, okay, you need, you need a room this big, but what's the purpose of this room? What do you do in this room? What, how do you want it to support you as a person or as a family or as an organization? And how do you want to make, you want it to make you feel? And do you do you find people uh, kind of taken back by the question, how do you want this room to make you feel? Yes. Do you think that a lot of times they're like, whoa, I never thought about how I want to feel because of a space? Well, it, yes. And, and they also, it's often very difficult for them to articulate hmm. in objective terms what, the answer to that question. They, they right. don't have a language to do it because, and so uh, it often uh, becomes, well, can you collect images, much like I collect right. images, that, that give us insight to what makes, what you, what resonates with you? What, right. what makes you, uh, what, what do you think would make you feel uh, happy if, if that could be part of your life? Uh, this goes to the, the bridging between the really, architecture can be a very technical and is a very technical uh, profession. Uh, there's, uh, and there are, uh, there's a language that professionals use to achieve all the technical requirements of a, of a building project. Um, but there's, got to be another language that allows the architect and the client to communicate effectively beyond the technical stuff because really mm -hmm. you can hire an architect a good architect should as a baseline be able to execute the technical requirements of the project yeah for the client satisfaction sure it's it's the architect being able to partner with the client in an understanding of a, a broader sense of goals and achievements that the the enterprise is trying to address uh, and that's can, that varies from client to client some clients co arrive very ready and able to articulate that other clients are dumbfounded by that question right. and and need a lot of help to Right. to 
understand how important it is that they answer it for themselves because right. otherwise what we all experience in our profession is uh, it will be when the building's under construction and the opportunity to significantly change course or influence the outcome of the design uh, that has been prepared uh, when they walk through a space and go, oh, I didn't realize it was gonna feel like this or it was gonna look like this. I know I've been looking at plans, you've given me renderings, you've done all this stuff, but I, I didn't realize until I could walk into it that uh, I hadn't communicated what I really wanted you to try to do for me. And, right. uh, and one of the great things that's happening right now uh, with technology is and we're implementing this in our office right now is the ability to use virtual reality software where at the digital models that everyone uses in our profession now which create three-dimensional digital space uh, in um, the creation of our documents we can now have people put on a pair of goggles and walk into the <laughs> digital cool. model yeah and we recently had that experience with our client that we're designing uh, an expansion to their office space for. And we had one of the uh, executives in our office and we were getting a demonstration of this technology and we said, hey, check this out. So um, I, I actually, it's in our building, so I went and got him and I said, come here, you need to see this because we were walking around in his future office space and he uh, was so excited about it he thanked us, said, this is great. I didn't understand as well as I now understand, and I'm excited because it's what, I'm, what I want. Um, and about 15 minutes later, he came back with the president of the organization and said, here, put the goggles on him, too. Do this, too. And, and he walked around, and, and he was like, this is great. I now understand right. what the outcome of all this is going to be. So mm -hmm. that is a very bright future, I think, for both the architect and the client to better able to sh communicate to one another uh, what what they're trying to do right. together. It, it's, a, it's always been an interesting um, balance in, in my own profession to understand that your technical capabilities uh, serve what people are paying you for, right? So if, yeah. if you're going to limit yourself to making buildings that stand up and hold the weather out and keep a person warm, you're, you're very much going to limit yourself in, you know, the amount of money you can make, uh, the absorbent fees that you can charge, because the, you know, the technical aspects can be taught and uh, they, they are boxes that can be checked. It's not that crazy difficult but it's the feel that if you can create a feel that translates that's when you become a uh like that's amazing i want that that's right you know and i i saw that in my own work as a photographer where many times i'd fall short on technical things and i'd make sure to brand those mistakes into my head mm. But I did them because I was I was reaching for the feel, you know, and it uh, I I pay really close attention when I when I come up short on things for technical purposes, and I do get geeky about technical things. But I know at the same time that the feel is what you're being paid for, you know, that's right. and that's where you get the ability to sell it. Um, so that that's a an interesting thing that you kind of communicated there in your process is like you tick all those objective boxes, but then you walk into that, that, uh, very nuanced conversation of trying to understand what a person is looking for when they can't even tell you exactly what it is. Sometimes mm -hmm. you try and understand the feel that they want, or you at least educate them to a point of understanding that you should be considering that you will be given a feeling by a building. You may not even understand it yet, but like your client came back to you and said, like, we don't want to put a big donut hole in the middle of our building. But then later they say, I don't know what it is, but every time I walk in here, I feel great. You know, right. like success. You, yeah. you know, you did the right thing. 
Um, last question. What makes a great building for you? Or successful building for you is the actual question. <laughs> I think it's when it stops me in my tracks yep. you know i i uh because for me it's it could be an 800 year old building it could be a 1500 year old building or it could be a building that was finished yesterday i don't think design is How do I articulate this? I I think when I feel wonder and awe and a sense of astonishment at the uh, power a building or place has on how I experience the world, that's a great building. Uh, that's a great design. And sometimes it's accidental and unintentional. Sometimes it's, it, it isn't. Sometimes, it, perhaps as an architect, I'm not being very articulate, I guess, and I'm using words that, that are, um, are, again, reach into the realm of how something affects me emotionally and and communicates in a way that is really meaningful to me. And I, and I, that, uh, um, I'm really at a loss for words here for a moment. Um, I, you earlier referenced walking into the Pantheon and the impact it had on you. I had the same experience when I walked into the Pantheon. You move in, you look up at the big Oculus, you feel the scale and the, the power of that space inside of yourself, and you just stop and you look, mm. and you're like, wow. This is incredible. And that for me is what I'm trying to do as an architect as much as I can. And, you know, it's really interesting. You, uh, all of us, I think, as human beings, strive to have that kind of experience woven into the fabric of our lives. And, so much of your experience isn't of that caliber or uh, it, it's, and so there's, it's the exception and not the rule, but how do you make the exception of experiencing really powerful and beautiful and meaningful places and spaces more, a greater proportion of your life and mm -hmm. uh, and I think my work as an architect over my life has been to try to increase the percentage of opportunity that exists in the world to uh, elevate what it means to be to be a human being and and uh, in the world through the built environment. Uh, so. And I and you know you keep it's so challenging to find the conditions that allow you to even try to do a great building. Mm -hmm. It's it, yeah. it, so much of it is dependent is beyond the control of the architect, yep. and in the hands of primarily the client uh, to uh, that that when you get those opportunities, uh, you, you really want to pour your heart and soul into the effort to take advantage of that opportunity. And then you want to seek to position yourself to have more opportunities like that. And the, the 
great work that firms do in the world uh, often is a product of having hit a home run with a great building and it attracts the clients that gives that opportunity, that architect, the opportunity to try to hit another home run. Right. And there are great architects who never get that opportunity. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it's, I think it's something that animates and drives and, uh, and pulls into the profession, uh, people who want to practice architecture. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, have you been to the uh, Exeter Library? Yes. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me. The uh, You walk, yeah, I'd, I'd walk right past it and not even think about going in from the exterior, but you walk inside and it's that moment of wonder that just hit, it, it'll knock you on your back. Oh. It's just, oh, yeah. the, I think it's all marble staircases, if I remember when you like come in the door and it's like, what's that? And then you look up and it's, just sort of heroic space just I incredible mean, yeah it's yeah. A, it's a similar uh thing with the circle uh and sphere of the pantheon you yeah. know built into the the interior of that but yeah that uh that that awe-inspiring wonder that someone did something there and and like you're saying the difficulty of making stuff like that happen it's all it's another interesting se- but separate com- uh conversation around the personalities that will rise to that level they have to have the combination of the ability to aesthetically see what Mm -hmm. something can be but then they have to have the fortitude to push a client to that place and they will often be very unpleasant people to be able to get those you know and you look at you know the the steve jobs the frank lloyd wright their their lives are just horrendous but they achieve these great things and for me it's very reflective to consider that like, you know, who do I want to be? And, you know, in considering what I want to get done, but knowing the risk you take at the person you become to achieve that, that's a really interesting for the next conversation. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really quickly, I, in, after Christmas, we're going to Bilbao to see the Guggenheim museum. As oh, I'd a, love to as come. A Thanks. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> As a I'll pilgrimage. Be your tag-long photographer. There you go. And I, I, there are many people in my profession who I have said that, you know, Frank Gehry, I, you know, his stuff, I just don't. I've always admired Gehry's work, and I get it. I get it. And the, the, so I'm very excited to go to Bilbao and see this, this building, but I, I've, I know what led to the creation of that building in significant parts is because Frank got a had a client that wanted him to design him a house a very very wealthy man and he worked on it for about 10 years and was paid in effect to do all kinds of research and development on many of the techniques and um, and design elements that when he got the commission to do Bilbao, he never built the house. The client spent 10 years paying oh, wow. him to design it. It changed, you know, probably a hundred times. And then he said, you know what? I'm at this stage of my life. I don't need this big, expensive, crazy house. I'm not going to build it. But then he got the opportunity to do the Guggenheim in Bilbao and the ideas and the research and the thinking uh, was able to all go right into over. that building. And, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, in terms of emotion, I have read that when Philip Johnson went to see the Guggenheim for the first time, his response was to burst into tears, mm. that the emotion of that, uh, place and building uh, overwhelmed him, and I hope I have a similar experience when I see. <laughs> All right, you're gonna have to YouTube that. Do some some crying art, crying architecture <laughs> tours. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you seen Frank Gehry's? I think it was his first house that he owned. 
that he personally like renovated. I, I and have tore not apart. seen it. No, I mean it's got like chain link fence. Yeah, the photographs. Yeah, and he like just cut like right through part of it, and there's just exposed uh, structure it. and framing oh, from this oh, old yeah. house, and it's extremely um, just out there. But you know, you can see where it where it led him, where he came from, and where it took him. It's it's very interesting. Yeah. But, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, be sure to catch Patrick's article in the February issue of Main Home Design, a AIA Design Theory article. And uh, again, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for inviting me.